Building a Bridge, a book about LGBT Catholics and their church, has generated a good deal of conversation, commentary, and critique in print, online, and in parish settings. So I'd like to respond to the most common questions and critiques in the interest of continuing the conversation. First, why didn't you mention church teaching on same-sex relations and same-sex marriage? Well, the short answer is that I did mention those teachings in my book, but I think the question is probably more, why didn't I mention them more? That was intentional, because the church's stance on these matters is clear. Sexual relations between people of the same sex are impermissible. So is same-sex marriage. But these are teachings that every single LGBT Catholic knows and have been told over and over and over again. In fact, sometimes it's the only things that Catholics know about LGBT issues. At the same time, the LGBT community's stance on those teachings is also clear. Same-sex relations are part and parcel of their lives. I'm leaving out the relatively small portion of the LGBT community that thinks otherwise. Theologically speaking, you could say that these teachings have not been received by the LGBT community to whom they were directed. So I intentionally did not focus on those topics since not only are those teachings well known, but they're also areas on which the two sides are just too far apart. Overall, I preferred to focus on areas of possible commonality. Second, why are you so intent on using words like gay and LGBT? Another common critique is over the invitation to move away from terms like same-sex attraction in favor of terms the LGBT community uses. The critique is that terms like gay and LGBT identify people solely by their orientations. And Catholics are, as one reviewer said, greater than their inclinations. I believe that too. So do many LGBT people who are more than their orientations or identities. But we do have to settle on terminology for people who have felt excluded based on their sexual orientation or identity. So why not use what the group itself uses? To suggest otherwise is to arrogate to oneself the right to name someone else. But groups have a right to name themselves. There is an irony here. The most common alternative is same-sex attraction. But this antiquated term does the same thing that LGBT and gay are critiqued for doing, that is, identifying a person only by their sexual urges. In fact, for good measure, same-sex attraction includes the word sex. By that yardstick, it is hardly an improvement. I always wonder if the resistance to gay and LGBT is because these are terms preferred by LGBT people, so using them is a form of caving. Nonetheless, if one persists in using a term that a group finds outdated or offensive, it's going to be very hard to dialogue at all. Besides, if Pope Francis can say the word gay, so can the rest of us. Third, when you talk about conversion in your book, what do you mean? In many gospel stories, we see Jesus welcoming people who then feel moved to conversion. One example is the story of Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector in Jericho, who would have also been considered as the chief sinner in the area. As Jesus passes through Jericho, Zacchaeus climbs a tree to get a better look. And Jesus, rather than condemning him, offers to come to his house, a sign of public welcome. In return, Zacchaeus promises to repay anyone he has defrauded. For Jesus here, it's community first, conversion second. That's a great story for LGBT Catholics who feel on the margins, like Zacchaeus did. It's also a great story for church officials because it reminds us to welcome first. But what kind of conversion are LGBT Catholics called to? The kind that we're all called to. I don't mean to single them out as sinful either, because we're all sinners. Rather, it's to point out that they often feel as marginalized as Zacchaeus did, and that an encounter with Jesus can move us to a conversion of minds and hearts. And by the way, I'm not talking about conversion therapy either. Overall, we should always lead with welcome, just like Jesus did. Fourth, how can you ask LGBT Catholics to treat the church with respect, compassion, and sensitivity? You know, I should have been clearer about this in the book, so here goes. The onus for bridge building is on the institutional church, clergy and church officials, including lay people. Because it is the institutional church that has made the LGBT community feel marginalized, not the other way around. But we're all called to be respectful of one another, including LGBT Catholics towards the hierarchy. Why? Because we're all Christians. Yes, it can be a very tough pill for LGBT people who have felt ignored, insulted, and excluded in the church. But this is coming from Jesus, not from me. 
even if you still think that some church leaders are your enemies, we're asked to love them and pray for them. And surely that love includes respect. It's hard, I know, but it's part of being Christian. Finally, what do you expect to happen next? When the former Superior General Pedro Arupe was once asked, where is the Society of Jesus going? He responded, I have no idea. The Holy Spirit is in charge, as in all things. I can't predict where this call for bridge building will go, but I have some ideas where it could go. Listening sessions with LGBT Catholics, bishops no longer firing LGBT people, pastors including them in their homilies, mainly all levels of church leadership helping them feel welcome. One reviewer wrote that I am, quote, excessively optimistic, end quote. Well, guilty as charged, I am excessively optimistic because I believe in the Holy Spirit. So let the conversation continue.